Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be looking at the macroeconomics graphs that you need to know for your final exam or AP economics exam. If after watching this video you still feel like you need a little help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review booklet. It has practice sets, a practice exam, it has answers and explanations, it has a graph cheat sheet, a formulas cheat sheet, plus exclusive online practice games. If you want to pick up yourself a copy, head down to the links below in the description. Now let's get on to the macroeconomics graphs. The first thing we're going to do is go over a couple of graphs that you may have already learned in microeconomics. If you feel like you already really understand the production possibilities curve and supply and demand graphs, skip ahead to the macro only sections. The first graph we're going to look at is the production possibilities curve. The production possibilities curve is a graph that shows all possible combinations of production for two different goods or categories of goods that an economy can produce. Here we're going to draw a graph for an economy that can produce both robots and corn. If they produce only robots and no corn, they would have a point of production about right there. If they produced only corn and no robots, they'd have a point of production right there. We could also have many points in between showing all the different combinations of corn and robots this economy could produce. Connect those dots and it gives us our production possibilities curve. That curve there shows the maximum levels of production between the two different goods that this economy could produce. Instead of specific goods, you could actually see this graph with categories of goods like capital goods and consumer goods or guns and butter. When you see a bowed out curve that is concave to the origin, that will be an indication of increasing opportunity costs. As this economy produces more and more corn, the opportunity costs in terms of robot production increases as more corn is produced. We see that increasing opportunity costs as we move down that curve, increasing our production of corn. The opportunity costs of robots get bigger and bigger and bigger as we move down that curve. The reason for this increasing opportunity cost is due to imperfectly adaptable resources. The resources that are good at producing robots are not going to be equally good at producing corn and vice versa. If you see a linear curve that is a straight line production possibilities curve, that will be an indication of constant opportunity costs. Here we have cakes and cookies. As we increase our production of cakes here, the opportunity cost in terms of cookies is constant as more and more cake is produced. The reason for constant opportunity costs is because the resources used for these two goods will be perfectly adaptable. That means that the resources used to produce cake will be equally adaptable to the production of cookies and vice versa. When you see a level of production that is on that production possibilities curve, that is an efficient level of production. In macroeconomics, we would call that long run equilibrium. It means that all resources are being used to their maximum potential. If you see levels of production that are within the production possibilities curve, that is an indication of inefficient use of resources. Some resources are sitting idle and not being used to their maximum potential. In macroeconomics, we see that as a recessionary gap with lots of workers who are unemployed. Points outside the curve are impossible because of scarcity. We do not have the resources to produce an unlimited amount of corn and robots at the same time. With comparative advantage, specialization, and trade, it is possible for economies to consume outside their production possibilities curve, but not produce. A outward shift of the production possibilities curve comes from an increase in the quality or quantity of resources. With more land, labor, capital, or entrepreneurship, we will see an increase in the possible production of corn and robots. In macroeconomics, we call that economic growth. It's an increase in the long run potential real GDP. If there was a decrease in the quality or quantity of resources, like from a natural disaster, we would see that as a shift inward of the production possibilities curve. It would no longer be possible to produce as much corn or robots in this economy. If we saw a technology change that only impacted the production of one good, in this example, an increase in the technology for the production of corn, we would see an outward shift of just the corn side of this production possibilities curve. The production possibilities of robots wouldn't have changed, but the possible production of corn would have increased. The next graph we're going to look at is supply and demand. We're going to look at each of those curves separately and then put them together. First, demand. The law of demand tells us that consumers will buy more at low prices and less at higher prices. That's ceteris paribus, of course, meaning other things don't change. When we put that on the graph, we see a downward sloping demand curve, which shows the inverse relationship between price and quantity. That means that when prices rise, the quantity demanded will decrease, and when prices fall, the quantity demanded will increase. Remember, price changes quantity demanded. It does not change demand. A change in demand is a shift of that demand curve. If there is only a change in price, we just move along that demand curve. 
So what will shift the demand curve? Well, we have some demand curve shifters that you need to know. First of all, we have consumer tastes and preferences. If something is popular, it will increase demand. If something's not popular, it will decrease demand. Next is market size. That's the number of buyers available to purchase a product. An increase in the number of buyers will increase the demand. A decrease in the number of buyers will decrease the demand. Next, we have prices of related goods. For substitutes, an increase in price will increase the demand for the other good. Substitutes are goods that can be used interchangeably, like honey and jam. Complements, on the other hand, are goods that go alongside each other, like jam and peanut butter. When the price of one good increases, demand for the other one will decrease, and vice versa. When it comes to changes in income, for normal goods, an increase in income will increase the demand for the product, like shoes and most other goods. Inferior goods, like condensed soup, will see an increase in income causing a decrease in the demand for the product, and vice versa. And the last one is expectations for the future. Sometimes guesses about the future will impact how much people buy today. If you see an increase in the demand for the product, that is illustrated as a rightward shift of that demand curve. If there's a decrease in the demand for the product, that will be a leftward shift. So remember, right is an increase, and left is a decrease. Next up, we have supply. Ceteris paribus, an increase in price will cause an increase in the quantity supplied, and a decrease in price will cause a decrease in quantity supplied. There's a direct relationship between price and quantity supplied. When we put it on the graph, that's illustrated as an upward sloping supply curve, showing that direct relationship between price and quantity. When the price is low, we will have a low quantity, and when the price increases, we will see an increase in the quantity supplied. Likewise, when there's a decrease in that price, we will see a decrease in that quantity supplied. And just like with demand, price changes quantity supplied. It does not change supply. There are, of course, other things besides price that can change supply, and that will be illustrated as a shift of that supply curve. What are those supply shifters? First of all, we have input prices. When there's an increase in the resource price used in the production of a product, that will decrease supply and vice versa. When it comes to government tools, taxes will decrease supply, subsidies will increase supply, and regulations generally will decrease supply. Next, we have the number of sellers. More sellers will increase supply and fewer sellers will decrease supply. Changes in technology will generally increase supply. When it comes to the prices of other goods, producers will decrease the supply of one good when the price of another good they can produce increases. And just like with demand, the expectations of the future can also impact the supply. When we put it on the graph and show that increase in supply, just like with demand, it's a rightward shift. It looks like a downward shift, but that rightward shift is an increase in the quantity at every price along that supply curve. And when we decrease supply, that's going to be shown as a leftward shift of that supply curve. Right is an increase and left is a decrease. When we put those two curves on the same graph, we get an intersection point where the two curves cross. That's the equilibrium point. It's the price where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Now a market will seek that equilibrium price. When prices are above equilibrium, we will have a surplus. The quantity supplied will be greater than the quantity demanded, and that will push prices downward towards that equilibrium. When prices are below equilibrium, we will have a shortage, and prices will eventually rise because quantity demanded will be greater than quantity supplied, and that shortage will push the price up towards equilibrium. Now equilibrium is the price and quantity we will typically get within a market. When there's an increase in demand, we will see the equilibrium price increase and the equilibrium quantity also increase. When there's a decrease in demand, that will decrease the equilibrium price and decrease the equilibrium quantity. Increasing the supply will decrease the price and increase the quantity, and decreasing the supply will increase the price and decrease the quantity. I don't suggest you memorize all those shifts. I suggest when in doubt, graph it out. The next graph we're gonna talk about is the ASAD model. That's the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model of the entire economy. First part of that is the aggregate demand curve. The aggregate demand curve is a demand curve for not just one good, but all goods and services within an entire economy. Just like a demand curve for a single product, it is a downward sloping curve, and it shows the inverse relationship between the price level and the quantity of real GDP that we will have within an economy. At high price levels, we have low quantities of real output, and at low price levels, we have high quantities of real output. The three reasons why we have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve are the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the net export effect. The aggregate demand shifters are the output expenditure formula for GDP. We have consumer spending, gross investment, government purchases, and net exports. C plus I plus G plus X. Those are your aggregate demand shifters and your formula for the output expenditure model of GDP. And just like in micro, a rightward shift of that aggregate demand curve is an increase and a leftward shift is a decrease. The short run aggregate supply curve is the supply of all goods and services within an economy 
in the short run. It looks just like a supply curve for a single good. It's upward sloping. At low price levels, we have low quantities of real output. And at high price levels, we have higher quantities of real output. The reason why we have an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve is because wages are sticky in the short run. Here are the short run aggregate supply curve shifters. First of all, we have resource prices. When wages increase, we will see a decrease in short run aggregate supply. And when wages decrease, we will see an increase in short run aggregate supply. Productivity is the next one. If there's an increase in productivity, it will shift that short run aggregate supply curve to the right. Next, we have inflation expectations. An increase in inflation expectations will shift that short run aggregate supply curve to the left, and a decrease in inflation expectations will shift the short run aggregate supply curve to the right. The next one, we have business taxes. If on your exam you see a decrease in taxes from the government, that will generally increase disposable income, and with that, consumer spending, which is an aggregate demand curve shifter. But if they specify business taxes, we can assume this is going to be a reduction of business costs, and that will increase production of all goods and services within an economy. And there, it will be a short run aggregate supply curve shift to the right. And the last one is business regulations. If we see a decrease in business regulations from the government, we will see a rightward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve. Likewise, an increase in regulations on business will decrease that short run aggregate supply curve, shifting it to the left. And on the graph, a shift to the left is a decrease and a shift to the right is an increase. On the ASAD model, we have a third curve and that's the long run aggregate supply curve. It is a vertical supply curve at the quantity of full employment output. On the graph, we have that vertical long run aggregate supply curve and YF is underneath. That stands for national income at full employment. And since we have a perfectly inelastic long run aggregate supply curve, at low price levels, we will see the full employment level of output. And at high price levels, we will still see the full employment level of output. This is, of course, in the long run. In the short run, that might not be true. And the reason why we have a long run aggregate supply curve that is vertical at the full employment output is because wages are flexible in the long run. That long run aggregate supply curve lines up with potential long run production for an economy. What will shift it? We have the quantity of resources, quality of resources, productivity of those resources, and technology. Anything that shifts the production possibilities curve will also shift the long run aggregate supply curve. A leftward shift is a decrease and a rightward shift is an increase. So that long run aggregate supply curve is the long run potential output for an economy. The short run equilibrium we find in the ASAD model is found at the intersection between the aggregate demand curve and the short run aggregate supply curve. Where those two curves intersect, we get our current equilibrium output and current price level labeled PL1 and Y1 here. In order to find an inflationary gap, we will add the long run aggregate supply curve here. An inflationary gap means that we are currently producing more than our long run potential output. And so when we put the long run aggregate supply curve in here, we will put that full employment output and the vertical curve to the left there of the current output of Y1. Because here, our current output, Y1, is greater than our full employment output of YF. Here we have low unemployment, but inflationary pressure within this economy. If we want to draw a recessionary gap, that means that the current output is less than the long run potential output. We will draw in that long run aggregate supply curve on the other side of the current equilibrium because a recessionary gap means that Y1 will have to be less than YF. There, national income is low and unemployment is high. The last way to draw this graph is that long run equilibrium. Here you have all three curves intersecting. That means that our current level of output is equal to our full employment output labeled YF here. And here our current price level is PL1. When the economy is at long run equilibrium, the unemployment rate equals the natural rate of unemployment. If our economy is currently at long run equilibrium and we have a positive aggregate demand shock to the economy, that means that consumption, gross investment, government spending, or net exports have increased, it will shift that aggregate demand curve to the right. Now the price level increases and the real output increases and we find ourselves with an inflationary gap. This is called demand pull inflation. If we have a negative aggregate demand shock, that means that consumption, gross investment, government purchases, or net exports are decreasing, that will be shown as a leftward shift of that aggregate demand curve. And now we have a recessionary gap. We could have a positive supply shock to the economy that could come from a decrease in energy prices, and that would be shown as a rightward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve. We would see a decrease in prices and a higher quantity of real output. Here we now have an inflationary gap. If we have a negative supply shock to the economy that would come from increases in wages or an increase in the price of oil, 
that could cause a leftward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve. And now we have a higher price level and a lower quantity of real output. We call this situation cost push inflation. It's also known as stagflation because we have higher prices and a stagnant economy with high unemployment. The ASAD model shows us that the economy will fix itself in the long run. If we have a recessionary gap, that means that we have a lot of workers who are unemployed. In the long run, wages and other resource prices are going to fall. That will mean input costs are now lower, and those lower input costs will cause businesses to produce more output, and that will cause a rightward shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve, restoring our economy to long-run equilibrium. We have lower wages, but we have restored the full employment level of output. If we find ourselves with an inflationary gap, the economy can fix itself here too, and we will see that in the form of an increase in wages and other resource prices that will mean higher input costs for businesses, and that will equate to a leftward shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve, closing that inflationary gap and restoring long-run equilibrium at a higher price level. If we find ourselves with an output gap in the ASAD model, the government can use fiscal policy to close that gap more quickly than waiting for the long run. If, for example, we have a recessionary gap, the government can use expansionary fiscal policy to increase government purchases or increase consumption. When they do that, it will shift the aggregate demand curve to the right, restoring our full employment level of output at a higher price level. If on the other hand, we have an inflationary gap, the government could increase taxes or decrease government purchases that would decrease G or decrease C, and that would result in a leftward shift of that aggregate demand curve, restoring full employment output again. The next graph we're going to look at is the money market graph. We have two parts, supply and demand. Money demand is a downward sloping curve that shows that the nominal interest rate is the opportunity cost for holding money. It's downward sloping when you put it on the graph, which shows that there's an inverse relationship between the nominal rate of interest and the quantity of money people demand. At high nominal interest rates, people demand fewer dollars, and at lower nominal interest rates, people demand higher quantities of dollars. The demand for money is comprised of two things. First is the asset demand for money. That's people's desire to hold their wealth as money. The second one is the transaction demand for money. That is the GDP, C plus I plus G plus X, and the price level. Those are the dollars we need to process the transactions within the economy. If either the asset demand for money or the transaction demand for money increase or decrease, that will shift the demand for money to the right or to the left. Just like every other demand curve you've learned about in this class, a rightward shift is an increase and a leftward shift is a decrease. When it comes to the money supply, it is determined by actions of the central bank and lending within the banking system. But the quantity of money within the money supply is not determined by the nominal interest rate. And that means when we have a high nominal interest rate, we will have one quantity of money. But if the nominal interest rate decreases, we will have the same quantity of money supply. If the central bank increases the money supply, there will be a rightward shift. If the central bank decreases the money supply, there will be a leftward shift. If a central bank with scarce reserves is going to have expansionary monetary policy to fight unemployment, they will buy bonds, lower the discount rate, or lower the reserve requirement, and that will cause an increase in the money supply, causing a decrease in the nominal interest rate. If the central bank with scarce reserves is going to fight inflation, on the other hand, they will use contractionary monetary policy. They will sell bonds, raise the discount rate, or raise the reserve requirement, and that will cause a leftward shift of that money supply curve, increasing the nominal interest rate. Now, when countries have an ample reserves banking system, the central bank in that country is actually going to use the reserves market graph to target interest rates instead of the money market graph. Here we see that reserves market graph. We have the quantity of reserves on that x-axis and the policy rate on the y-axis. And there are three portions of this demand curve. We have an upper flat portion at the discount rate, and then the demand curve becomes downward sloping. And finally, we have a lower end that is also flat, and that part moves with changes in interest on reserves. Interest on reserves is the interest rate that the Federal Reserve or other central banks with ample reserve systems pay banks on their reserves. And changes in that rate move the lower end of the demand curve, up with an increase and down with a decrease. When we throw in a supply of reserves curve on this graph, if that supply curve is intersecting the demand for reserves in the downward sloping portion, then this banking system has scarce reserves. But wherever that curve intersects the demand curve, that is where our policy rate is going to be found. Now, in the United States, we have an ample reserve system. That means that the supply curve is going to intersect the demand curve in that lower flat portion. And that gives us our policy rate very close to the interest on reserves rate. 
and central banks with an ample reserve system use open market operations to shift that supply curve and maintain the ample reserve system. If a central bank with ample reserves wants to have expansionary monetary policy, they will decrease interest on reserves. That lowers the lower portion of the demand curve in the reserves market graph and causes the interest rate to fall. The central bank could also decrease administered rates. That's going to shift the upper portion with the discount rate and the lower portion with the interest on reserves rate. Remember, administered rates are both the discount rate and the interest on reserves rate. And when both of those shift at the same time, that lower portion is the part we care about most. And there we see a decrease in the policy rate. If the central bank wants to have contractionary monetary policy, they could increase the interest on reserves rate. And that would shift the lower portion of that demand curve upward. And that increases the policy rate. A central bank with ample reserves can also increase administered rates. That's an increase in both the discount rate and the interest on reserves rate. Both of those are still going to shift the policy rate upward. And contractionary monetary policy is used to fight inflation. It shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left because higher interest rates mean less gross investment. If you have scarce reserves, that means we are selling bonds, raising the discount rate, or raising the reserve requirement. If we have ample reserves, we are either increasing administered rates or increasing interest on reserves. Either way, we're going to see a decrease in real output and a decrease in the price level in the ASAD model. If the central bank wants to fight unemployment, they can do that with expansionary policy. If we have scarce reserves, they will buy bonds, lower the discount rate, or lower the reserve requirement. If we have ample reserves, they're going to lower administered rates or interest on reserves. Lower interest rates from either policy are going to increase gross investment, and that's going to shift that aggregate demand curve to the right, and that will increase real output up to YF. But we will have higher price levels as a result. Now we're on to our next graph, which is loanable funds. We have two parts again, demand and supply. First, we're going to talk about the demand for loanable funds, and that's really the investment demand. We see a downward sloping curve, which shows the inverse relationship between the real interest rate and the quantity of investment that businesses will demand. That downward sloping curve is our investment demand. At high interest rates, we see a low quantity of investment demanded by businesses, and at low interest rates, we see a higher quantity of investment demanded. The investment demand shifters in the loanable funds market are anything that would change the potential profit for new purchases of investments. That could be changes in the economic outlook moving forward, investment tax credits, or other things that impact how much businesses think they can earn when they purchase new physical capital. A rightward shift is going to be an increase. A leftward shift is going to be a decrease. The supply curve in the loanable funds market is really the saving supply. The saving supply curve is upward sloping because there's a direct relationship between the real interest rate and the amount of money that people save in banks and in the bond market. At low interest rates, the quantity of savings is low, and at high interest rates, the quantity of savings is high. The saving supply curve can shift from changes in disposable income. If consumers have more income, they will increase their saving supply. If they have less income, it'll decrease the savings supply. The economic outlook, feeling good about the economy, decreases savings. Feeling bad about the economy, increases savings. And foreign investment. This is not the typical term investment where we mean purchases of physical capital. Foreign investment means foreign people saving their money in US banks and bond markets. That's foreign investment. And a rightward shift will be an increase, a leftward shift will be a decrease. Mix that saving supply and investment demand together and we get our loanable funds equilibrium. It's the real equilibrium interest rate and the quantity of investment or loanable funds we get. If there's an increase in the saving supply, we will see a decrease in the real interest rate and an increase in the quantity of loanable funds. The next aspect you need to know about the loanable funds market is this thing called crowding out. Crowding out says that an increase in the government deficit through expansionary policy, for example, will increase interest rates and with that, reduce gross investment. That leads to lower economic growth in the future. There are two ways to look at the crowding out aspect of the loanable funds market. One is to increase the demand for loanable funds because the government is demanding loans alongside businesses. That would be a rightward shift of that investment demand curve, which increases that real interest rate, resulting in a lower quantity of investment purchased by businesses. If you use this method to illustrate crowding out on the loanable funds market, just be aware that the increase in the quantity of loanable funds there on that x-axis does not mean there was an increase in gross investment. There was actually a decrease in gross investment because the government has borrowed enough money to crowd it out. 
The other way of illustrating crowding out on the loanable funds market is to decrease the supply of loanable funds. Decreasing the supply of loanable funds essentially says that the government has taken supply from that public market. And what's left for the private market is a reduction in the supply. That increases the interest rate and reduces the quantity of investment that businesses will buy. Here with this method, we actually see the decrease there on that x-axis, which tells us that we do have a decrease in investment. Use whichever method you prefer or the one your professor or teacher uses. That's what I'd advise. But either way, we see a decrease in gross investment as a result of the government deficit spending, increasing interest rates, and crowding out investment. Next up, we have the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve shows us the relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. The first part of this model is the short run Phillips curve, which shows there's an inverse relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. At high inflation rates, we have low unemployment, and at low inflation rates, we have high unemployment. In the long run though, that relationship between inflation and the unemployment rate breaks down. As a result, we have a long run Phillips curve that is vertical at the natural rate of unemployment. Where those two curves intersect, we get our expected inflation rate, abbreviated pi E here. And when the economy is at long run equilibrium, we will have the natural rate of unemployment and the expected inflation rate. If the economy is in an inflationary gap, that is shown as a point high up on the short run Phillips curve. If the economy is in a recessionary gap, that is shown as a point at the bottom of the short run Phillips curve. Now the short run Phillips curve is really a mirror image of the short run aggregate supply curve. Movement caused by a shift in the aggregate demand curve is illustrated as movement along the short run Phillips curve, just as it is a movement along the short run aggregate supply curve. And shifts of the short run aggregate supply curve are shown as an opposite direction shift of the short run Phillips curve. Here we have the Phillips curve at long run equilibrium. And over here we have the ASAD model at long run equilibrium. In both models, we're at point A. If we see a leftward shift of the aggregate demand curve, that will put us in a recessionary gap. And we are now at point B in this model. We see that we move down to the left along the short run aggregate supply curve. On the Phillips curve model, that is shown as a mirrored rightward shift, still downward movement along that short run Phillips curve to point B. If we see a rightward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve over here in the ASAD model, that would be shown as a leftward shift, still downward, over here in the Phillips curve model. That long run Phillips curve will only shift from changes in the natural rate of unemployment, which means that anything that would change structural unemployment or frictional unemployment would shift that curve. Rightward shift would be an increase in the natural rate, a leftward shift would be a decrease in the natural rate. Our last graph is the foreign exchange market, and here we have demand and supply once again. Here we're going to look at the demand for currency, and in this case, US dollars. We see a downward sloping demand curve, which shows that at high exchange rates, people demand fewer US dollars, and at lower exchange rates, people demand greater quantities of US dollars. The supply of currency is upward sloping because there's a direct relationship between the exchange rate and the quantity of US dollars that people supply. At high exchange rates, people supply a high quantity of US dollars, and at low exchange rates, people supply a low quantity of US dollars. Put the two curves together on the graph and we have our equilibrium exchange rate and our equilibrium quantity of dollars. Here are the demand shifters in the foreign exchange market for US dollars. First of all, we have foreign taste. If consumers in foreign countries want more US goods, they will demand higher quantities of US dollars at every exchange rate. The next one is foreign national income. If foreign people have more income, they will buy more of everything, including more US goods. And with that, they'll demand higher quantities of US dollars. Next, we have price levels, both domestic and foreign. If our price level falls, then foreign people will demand more US dollars to buy our cheaper US goods. Interest rates also impact the demand for US dollars because foreign investors will seek higher rates of return. When interest rates are high in the United States, foreign investors demand more US dollars. And the last one is the expected future exchange rate. I would like to note that these ones here are impacted by monetary and fiscal policy. Keep that in mind. Over on the supply shifters, we see a lot of similarity here. First of all, under the category of demand for imports, we have domestic tastes for foreign goods. If we like more Chinese made goods, we are going to supply more US dollars as we attempt to buy Chinese currency to buy their goods. We also have the domestic level of income. If we have more money, we buy more of everything, including more foreign goods. And with that, we will supply more US dollars. Finally, under this category of demand for imports, we have the price levels in our country and in other countries. If our price level falls, then we will demand fewer foreign goods, supplying fewer dollars. We also see interest rates as a supply shifter because foreign investors seek 
high rates of return. If interest rates in the United States fall, then foreign investors will sell their assets in the United States, supplying more dollars in the international markets as they purchase currencies where interest rates are higher. And the last one again is expected future exchange rates. And once again, these ones here are impacted by monetary and fiscal policy. Let's try out an example and put it on the graph. If we see a decrease in United States national income, that will mean that US imports are going to decrease. Consumers will buy less of everything, including foreign made goods. Since we are buying fewer foreign made goods, we're going to supply fewer US dollars in the exchange markets. That will increase our equilibrium exchange rate and decrease the equilibrium quantity of dollars in the market. If we look at this from the Mexican peso perspective, we would see that a decrease in US national income would lead to Mexico exporting less. When that happens, the demand for the Mexican peso is going to decrease and that will cause the Mexican peso to depreciate, which means the exchange rate fell. Let's do one more example. Here, the United States interest rate increases. How's that going to impact the exchange rate for the Mexican peso? First of all, with the interest rate being higher in the United States, Mexico is going to see a capital outflow. Meanwhile, the United States is going to see a capital inflow. Foreign investors seeking the higher rate of return in the United States will sell Mexican pesos, increasing the supply. At the same time, we will see a decrease in the demand for pesos as foreign investors are less likely to seek that lower interest rate. That double shift is going to drive that exchange rate downward, causing the Mexican peso to depreciate. The quantity here is indeterminate. Also, a little side note, the supply of loanable funds in Mexico would decrease and the supply of loanable funds in the United States would increase. Whoa, there you have it. Those are all the graphs that you are likely to see on your AP macroeconomics exam. Now, if you still need a little more help, head down to reviewecon.com where there are lots of games and activities to help you practice the skills you need to know on your exam. If you still need more help and want to support this channel, head down to the link below and purchase the total review booklet from reviewecon.com. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.